Hi, my name is Niklas Hohmann and I will talk about how changing deposition rates can alter the stratigraphic distribution of fossils and how this control of the fossil record can be reversed with a newly developed statistical method. One of the major sources of information for paleontology is not only what types of taxa we find, but also where we find them. This is, for example, an important source of information for biostratigraphy or to trace the changes of community composition throughout time. Or you can also use it in evolutionary biology to look at how morphological features change throughout time. However, recent research in the field of stratigraphic paleobiology has shown that the stratigraphic distribution of fossils is not a direct reflection of the underlying bi biological processes, but is strongly influenced by the sequence stratigraphic architecture. This sequence stratigraphic architecture can be divided into three sub-processes. The first process is facies change. Every taxon has its favorite environment and it will always migrate with this environment. In the fossil record, these environments are reflected by different facies. So a extinction of a taxon at a facies change might not reflect an actual extinction, but rather a migration of the taxon. The second process is the formation of hiatuses. The rock record is highly incomplete and consists of large periods of non-deposition that are only briefly interrupted by periods of deposition. This can, among others, lead to spikes of first and last occurrences above and below major hiatuses. The third process is uh, changing deposition rates. In the outcrop we never observe actual time between fossils, but only sediment that has been deposited in between fossils. So strongly changing deposition rates can lead to a strongly altered stratigraphic distribution of fossils in the outcrop. So all of these three processes are directly linked to the sequence stratigraphic architecture. And we also know that the main drivers of sequence stratigraphy is tectonics and changes in sea level. This makes these processes uh, present throughout all of this Earth's fossil record. In addition to that, it has been noted that four out of the big five mass extinctions actually coincide with times where there's drastic changes in sea level, which introduce a strong stratigraphic overprint. This all emphasizes that it's really important to have statistical methods available that allow to incorporate these three processes into a statistical analysis of the fossil record. I will present a method that allows to incorporate one of the three processes I discussed beforehand into the stratigraphic distribution of fossils, and that is changes in deposition rate. Here you can see a deposition rate shown in blue, but instead of the deposition rate, we will look at uh, the, the accumulated sediment, which is just the integral over the deposition rate. This function has some really nice properties, and that is it connects time with stratigraphic height. Uh, this can, for example, be used to take a sample um, of which we know when it has been deposited in the sediment and determine the stratigraphic height we will find it in the outcrop. Conversely, we can do the same for a sample found at a certain stratigraphic height. So if we know that this sample has been found at 17 meters stratigraphic height, we can reconstruct and determine that it has been deposited in the sediment after four time units. The same, of course, also works for more complex data structures like phylogenetic trees. On a slightly more abstract level, the model also allows to transform signals from time into stratigraphic height. So here the signal is shown in red and then it is combined with a deposition rate, which is constant. And then it can determine what pattern will we observe in, the strati in stratigraphic height in the outcrop. Here, the observed signal is identical to the original signal, just because the deposition rate is constant, which is the best possible case. 
now a more complex case. The deposition rate is dropping drastically and this is the pattern we will observe in the outcrop. It is very different from the original signal and it is not clear what happened to the maximum in the original signal. As a third example, uh, here drastic changes in deposition rate. At one point there's very high deposition rate, at the other point there's very low deposition rate, but still the same original signal. If this is transformed into stratigraphic height, um, we see a very different pattern. There is one drastic spike uh, that is generated by the condensation uh, caused by a low deposition rate, but it is hard to tell what parts of the observed signal actually is actually reflected uh, or reflects a part of the original signal. The methods I presented so far is based on the idea that we can actually reconstruct deposition rates. But this is really, really problematic in many cases. This is why I will now show one example on how to reconstruct these deposition rates and also how to deal with situations where there's different conflicting deposition rates and how to incorporate this situation in a paleontological analysis. The example I'm going to talk about is taken from Seymour Island, which is a small island in Antarctica. It's quite famous for its macrofossil fauna uh, and it documents the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary pretty well and it's supposed to be one of the best sites for sampling uh, this mass extinction in the southern hemisphere. So here you can see the age versus the stratigraphic height on Seymour Island. I will reconstruct a or I will reconstruct deposition models but not in terms of actual deposition rate, but rather in terms of accumulated sediment at a given age. From the literature, we know that there is the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, which is at, at approximately 66.04 million years ago and at uh, 1,007 meters stratigraphic height. And then we also have a geomagnetic reversal that can be dated exactly. With these two points of information, uh, we can start reconstructing our first deposition model. And that is a constant deposition rate, which is just basically connecting those two points. There are also indicators in the literature for a sequence stratigraphic overprint on Seymour Island. And that is, there is supposed to be a still stand at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary and a maximum flooding surface at approximately 960 meters stratigraphic height. The problem is we do not know the exact parameters of deposition rate and the duration of the maximum flooding surface to reconstruct an exact deposition model. So the idea is uh, to instead reconstruct a number of different deposition models and look how the different deposition models alter the interpretation of the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. For this, first three different durations of the maximum flooding surface are determined. A short maximum flooding surface, a medium maximum flooding surface and a long maximum flooding surface. This is then combined with different deposition uh, rates at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary here uh, indicated by those lines. The slope of these lines corresponds to the deposition rate at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. With this framework, nine different deposition models are reconstructed simply by recombining every maximum flooding surface with every deposition rate at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. As an example, this figure shows three different durations of the maximum flooding surface all with the same deposition rate at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Then the signal that is being transformed by these deposition rates is created. I will not go into detail about how this is done here. If you're curious, you can uh, watch my other talk where I go into more detail about how to uh, derive these rates of last fossil appearances. Now we can look at 
how do the different signals look in the in stratigraphic height. For example, here the same original signal of the mass extinction was transformed by two different deposition models into stratigraphic height and this is what we will actually see. Although they, there's a slight variation, we can still see that the overall idea behind those two rates is uh, very similar. On the other hand, um, these two rates look very, very different. The red one is uh, based on a constant deposition rate and the green one has a very long uh, maximum flooding surface and a low deposition rate at the still stand. So they vary a lot. This leads to the following idea. What we see is always the same underlying signal in time, but it is strongly altered by the deposition rate. And if the signal we observe in the stratigraphic height is very different dependent on what deposition rate we use, it is reasonable to say that the deposition rate has a strong influence on the interpretation of that signal. If the signals in the strat in stratigraphic height are always look very similar, it is obviously not that relevant which deposition rate we actually used for our transformation. And this can be exploited for a robustness analysis. So here in this plot, uh, the result of such a robustness analysis is um, shown. The numbers represent the different deposition models and the distance between the numbers represents how similar the resulting rates in stratigraphic rate are. So for example 8, 9 and 10 on the right side are very close to each other. So uh, if we transform the pattern of the last extinction by these deposition rates the result will always look very similar. Uh, so it does not matter whether we actually use deposition rate 8, 9 and 10 for the transformation. It can be said that these deposition rates are robust. On the other hand, the 1 is the deposition model with a constant deposition rate. It's quite, diff uh, quite far away from all other numbers. So no, if I use the constant deposition rate as a transformation, the results will always look very different from all the sequence stratigraphic interpretations we have constructed. And by systematically comparing the position of different numbers on this plot, um, you can see how much the interpretation is actually altered by the choice of deposition model. So as a summary of this talk, it can be said that changes in deposition rates have a strong influence on the stratigraphic distribution of fossils. The presented method allows to incorporate knowledge of these changes in deposition rates into paleontological analyses and to also assess robustness of different conflicting deposition rates into the analyses. However, Reconstructing deposition rates is a difficult task and it requires to actually change our sampling procedures. Because if there's a lesson from stratigraphic paleobiology, it is that only knowing the position of a fossil is not meaningful when we do not know what its depositional environment was. Thank you for your attention. All the work I presented here is actually based on my bachelor thesis and this bachelor thesis also tackles the question about how to incorporate hiatuses into a statistical analysis. If you have any questions you can write me an email or you can find my bachelor thesis in the link at the end of this video. And I would also like to thank my bachelor su supervisor Emilia Jarochowska for her constant support and her endless patience.